Good evening. Dr. Van Allen is not only head of the physics department at the State University of Iowa, he is chairman of the working group on internal instrumentation of the United States Earth Satellite Program, and more importantly, from the standpoint of this program this evening, he is chairman of the Rocket and Satellite Research Panel, an independent group of scientists who lead research for universities, industries, and the armed services. On December 29, 1957, that panel, containing as it does many of the most distinguished people in the rocket and satellite field, proposed the creation of a national space establishment which would have as its purpose and here I quote from the news, relief, the, the news release itself, to establish United States leadership in space research by 1960 and to maintain it thereafter. The proposal cites 10 goals within reach of a unified, vigorous national effort. And uh, I'd like to turn to the first sentence of that news dispatch. It says, a group of prominent scientists said today that the U.S. can put a manned satellite into orbit, orbit by 1962 if a national space establishment is created soon and given ample funds and powers. Five months later, on May 26, to be exact, John W. Finney of the New York Times News Service wrote the following paragraphs from Washington, D.C. Nearly eight months after the abrupt dawn of the space age, the United States still has no firm space program, organization, or funds. In fact, there has been no official decision on whether the United States should accept the challenge of the Russians in the race to the moon. These conclusions were drawn from the civilian and military officials responsible for drafting plans for space research. The space program has become bogged down in organizational disputes, technical evaluations and re-evaluations, multiplying layers of committees, budget limitations, and an underlying public and official apathy. It now appears that it will be almost a year after the first Soviet satellite was launched last October 4th before the United States will have a clear-cut program for the exploration of space. Even then, there is question whether the United States program will be aggressive enough to overcome the Soviet lead. Officials were asked, what has happened to our space program since last October? Typical answers were these. If you get right down to brass tacks, very little has been done. The program is on dead center, and all we have had since October is talk, talk, uh, Dr. Van Allen, after that elaborate introduction, I want to know if it's your opinion that the pace of our emergence into the space age is as painfully slow as Mr. Finney reports. Well, I think Mr. Finney is a little pessimistic. I do know, know Finney, and he's a very capable person, a very good newsman. But uh, I think he, what he says would have been well said about three months ago. But at the present date, he's quite out of date as to what is actually going on. For example, there's been some $250 million made available to the Advanced Research Projects Agency for getting on with the moon flights and manned space, uh, long-range manned space flights, uh, semi-satellite flights. There have been a number of new uh, satellite firings authorized for scientific purposes. These are going ahead quite actively around the United States. The uh, uh, the president introduced, uh, uh, er, through his budget bureau, wrote a bill proposing a national, uh, <coughs> a national, a national Aeronautics and Space Agency in April. Uh, this bill has been under active consideration by both houses of Congress. Special committees were created in both houses of Congress for the purpose the House Committee has reported out the bill, and it has been already passed by voice vote in the House without a single dissenting vote. Now, this is a major, uh, 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 provides for the establishment of a major agency of the government. The uh, consideration in Congress has lasted only about two months so far, and it has now passed the House, and the Senate Committee, I understand, will report it out to the Senate within a week or two. Now, this certainly, I should judge, in our representative form of government is a very prompt action. We do not have a dictatorship. We do not uh, have possess the speed of decision that's, that a dictatorship provides. But one must realize that there are honest differences of opinion about how vigorous and how expensive a space program we should have in this country. Well, now, is this moving fast enough to support the program that you and the rocket and satellite panel I spoke of uh, we're advocating as far back as last December. 
Uh, well, the National Space Establishment, which we, as we called it, or the National Aeronautics and Space Agency, as the President called it, is not yet in existence. This was one of our major uh, uh, desires and, and, a, and an element of the national picture which we feel is of major importance. However, on an interim basis, the uh, program is going ahead at a very rapid clip and, and uh, I, I can't see how one could do, do anything much faster physically than we're doing at the present time. Well, now Finney implies uh, very directly that there are some who are taking a second look at the matter of outer space and saying in effect that uh, we couldn't lose much even if we didn't get into a competition uh, for its exploration. Do you feel that we could lose greatly from not taking an active part in these matters? Well, I certainly do. I certainly agree that there are honest differences of opinion about the extent to which we should put our national resources and effort into outer space research. There are, on the one hand, many very strong enthusiasts which would make it a major piece of national business. On the other hand, there are those that feel it is really is nonsense and that it would be much better to put national effort and resources into, into things directly affecting human life and human welfare at the present time. For my own part, I stand between these two extreme views. I'm, I'm an enthusiast for uh, the development of space research. I think many aspects of it, such as putting a man in space, have been overemphasized. I, I, I think that's something that likely will be done and men will wish to do in time, but I don't regard that personally as a matter of, of national urgency. I think the aspect which is of the most national concern is not military, but is a, a matter of general cultural and intellectual leadership in the world. I had a very keen impression of this when I uh, visited in Spain two, two or three years ago. Uh, certainly one would agree that Spaniards are just as intelligent as we are, but th they're, they're so backward in terms of uh, technical and scientific developments that as a country it, it is a, a non-entity in world affairs. And on the, on the contrast to England, which is also a relatively small country population-wise, has maintained intellectual leadership and is in the forefront of everything going on in the world. Well, now you have alluded to the military, and I recall that in a talk before a university audience of students and faculty in March, uh, you placed a good deal of the responsibility for the early delay in our development of uh, satellites and outer, outer space exploration upon the military establishment and their internal bickerings. Do you find that this is still continuing? Is this still an obstacle to um, quick uh, emergence into the age of outer space? No, I think that's changed a good bit since uh, last Octo uh, uh, November uh, and October and November. At the present time, to my knowledge, all sensible programs are going ahead at about the greatest rate that's possible. But what about the constant relationship that seems always to be made between Earth satellites and ballistic missiles. You see them as two separate and uh, uh, relatively unrelated uh, entities, do you not? Or you hope to see them not constantly allied at any rate? Well, the objectives are quite different. Uh, how, there's no doubt, of course, that a, that a good long-range missile will make a good booster for, an, for a satellite flight so that uh, technically they're closely related. That is to say, a successful 5,000-mile missile capable of carrying, say, let us say, a ton for 5,000 miles is a splendid vehicle for boosting a scientific payload of let's say two or three hundred pounds into a satellite orbit or it is capable of, of flying say 50 pounds to the vicinity of the moon. Now these it's a question of objective rather than a technical um, foundation or vehicle. Well now if there is this relationship, Finney implies that there are some who are debating the question as to whether it is militarily important to get vehicles and man into space. And whether, uh, I'm quoting his article, whether from a scientific standpoint it is more important to conquer the cosmos uh, or such earthly problems as I suppose the military uh, have in mind, uh, more uh, strategic or tactical uh, problems. Uh, is this then, uh, is it then to be presumed that the, the military are looking at the Earth satellite only as 
uh, a testing device for testing their own ballistic missiles, or if they, on the other hand, do not feel that ballistic, that Earth satellites are of great significance, will we uh, lose support of the military? Uh, well, I think you've asked me quite a few questions <laughs> in, sure one, uh, in one bundle there. Uh, let me see if, uh, in the first place, there are military uh, applications for satellites. One of the most commonly mentioned one is the one for reconnaissance, namely having something equivalent to a television camera in a satellite looking down on the Earth. Now, uh, it's not going to be easy, but it is conceivable that one can, for example, uh, detect the movement of enemy fleets from a satellite and do a rather comprehensive survey all over the world as to what an enemy force might be doing. And this might extend to movement of ground troops, any unusual construction activities, uh, any uh, uh, extraordinarily heavy use of highways, mov movement of ships at sea, possibly locating surfacing submarines, things of this character. Now, this is certainly a possible military application. There are others uh, which, however, in my opinion, are more nearly and much more importantly of civilian applications are ones for the general benefit of the citizenry at large. Uh, ones of this sort are weather forecast, prediction, study of the weather, better understanding of the way in which the world's weather works, uh, uh, detailed following of the course of hurricanes and accurate prediction of hurricane the paths. Uh, eventually, it may well be possible to have some mild controlling effect by means of satellite techniques. This is not yet at all clear, but it seems to be a possibility. But it is your view, then, that the military do not pose any longer a serious problem to the advancement of the civilian interest in uh, s satellites. Well, I don't know that that's quite right. I think there are some quarters which still oppose, uh, some quarters within the military establishment which still oppose a major civilian effort in space uh, research. I think in the uh, House and the Senate, for the most part, the members of the Senate uh, committee are somewhat less favorably inclined toward a vigorous space program than those in the House. Now, uh, on the Senate committee, Senate Space Committee, Senator Symington impressed me as being one who is uh, rather uneasy about civilian, a major civilian agency of the government engaged in and having primary cognizance over space research. I, he, I gathered he felt there was some possibility that the uh, mission of the Air Force was being uh, taken over by a civilian agency, and he seemed rather uneasy about that as a possibility. Well, now, you testified before that committee, did you not? Uh, yes, that's and right. And wasn't there quite a bit of uh, pleasant and courteous uh, difference of opinion about the role of the military and the role of the civilian agency? Uh, that is correct. Yeah. That was the major uh, question mm -hmm. they had on their minds was, uh, do, would uh, the existence of a major civilian agency of the federal government charged with primary cognizance over space efforts, would such an agency uh, weaken the uh, defense capabilities of the country uh, in a military sense. And when you left Washington, what was your impression of the opinion of the committee in general? Well, I thought it was quite likely that both committees would approve the president's bill in substantially mm -hmm. the form in which it was delivered to them. And this judgment has been shown to be correct in the case of the House. Now, I do expect a less favorable treatment in the Senate, but I do think that we will get a, a bill out of the Senate as well. Hmm. well. Now I'd like to turn from any consideration of the military to another aspect of Mr. Finney's article, uh, which I think puts you right squarely in the middle of the thing. Uh, he says, now that the first hysteria over space has worn away, second thoughts are arising among scientists that an aggressive program of space exploration could divert men and money from other fields of necessary research. This concern is prevalent in the Science Advisory Committee, whose members are drawn primarily from universities, and that would be you, of course, among them, where the primary interest is in basic research rather than technological development of bigger and better space vehicles. Now, it seems to me that you might uh, easily be lined up on both sides of that question, or do you see it as a question at all? How, what is your reaction to those uh, paragraphs from Mr. Finney, Finney's article. Well, as I think I said earlier, I'm much less enthusiastic about manned space travel and purely uh, the pure development of vehicles than, than many others of my friends are. My main interest and our main interest here in the university 
is in using uh, space vehicles for pure scientific investigations. That's what we're doing here, and that's what we're interested in. And uh, so that, uh, I, I agree it is an expensive form of research. Uh, in that respect, it resembles high-energy nuclear research with very large cyclotrons, very large accelerating machines. However, there is no known human method for attacking the sorts of problems we're interested in than by a rocket-type uh, vehicle. And this has all often been referred to, uh, um, I shudder at the phrase, but as a laboratory in the sky. So yes. Mm. Well, now, uh, there is one further uh, development of that theme. Uh, some have said, uh, well, why do we neglect earthly problems, such as cancer research, for something as esoteric-seeming uh, as uh, outer space? And what, uh, what would your answer be to this sort of criticism? Well, I'm heartily in favor of any progress on preventing and curing cancer, of course. Uh, I think one should remark that uh, the, uh, the consumption of human beings is virtually unlimited. Now, we can have a, a television set in every room. Each member of a family can have an automobile. There is a question to what extent you, one should allow uh, just rampant uh, civilian consumption or personal consumption to be a major national objective. Now, I think for myself that uh, education, intellectual leadership should be a much more, uh, is a much more vital uh, matter. Uh, these two things are much more vital matters of national concern than improving the, uh, the uh, increasing individual consumption of goods. So uh, there's certainly, there's no limit to the uh, number of uh, things that a person can use, consume, uh, throw away, make use of in his daily life. But I think we must uh, adjust our sense of values in the general national interest. Now, I remember a figure that there's about three billion, that is three billion dollars spent each year for the purchase of cigarettes alone by persons in the United States. Now, this is, seems like quite a large number. And I feel that it is. A vigorous space effort in the United States can be supported for perhaps one-fifth to one-sixth of this amount. And I believe that it will have a, this I believe puts it in the proper perspective as what is required to, in, to uh, develop international leadership in this field is, so to speak, a minor part of what most of us throw away in a day in, in the form of tobacco. I take it you feel that we can do uh, certainly a maximum or a substantial effort in this area we're speaking of without doing harm to other kinds of research and other kinds of um, uh, material gains. We yes, may yes, I do. Well, now, you have also led me uh, to the question of education. Immediately following the launching of uh, the Russian satellite, there was much talk about education, and in that talk of yours in March that you, uh, that I referred to previously, you talked about education at length. I think many people have presumed that scientists, when they speak of education, mean education of more scientists, and when in reality, uh, your feeling, I take it, is somewhat more along the lines of world uh, political, economic, and sociological leadership, something of that sort. Is it not true? Uh, yes, that's correct. I think it is not at all clear that we have a shortage of scientists. I realize there's a difference of opinion on this point, but uh, when I look in on various of the aircraft companies and many of the industries w who employ scientific and technical people, my impression is they really have more than they need right now. And uh, I think that this is already beginning to show up as a lesser demand nationally for graduating students in engineering and science than was true two or three years ago. Now, of course, the government can create an artificial shortage by just granting huge contracts in, commercial, uh, in the commercial field for uh, military goods. Now, this naturally creates a demand for technical people. But as a basic uh, view, I, I think that we shouldn't over push the uh, idea of science and education. I think it has a very important part. I think it's, uh, it's a, uh, certainly a science is one of the great achievements of the human race, and it is a part and parcel of one's liberal arts understanding and appreciation of the affairs of men. But uh, I, I don't feel it should be pushed as a major and single-minded national endeavor in the way it appears to be in Russia. 
You would emphasize, I take it, though, uh, studies in other areas uh, that appear to have been neglected or perhaps at least uh, not supported as substantially as they might have been. Oh, yes. Is it your feeling that uh, right now we could use a great deal more in the way of leadership of the climate in which outer space exploration is to be conducted? Well, that's correct. I think the, uh, it's not a matter of uh, scientific incapability and has not been at all, as I think I may have pointed out before, but it's been a question of national decision and national leadership deciding on what are the important things to us as a nation. Well, now, right after the launching of Sputnik 1, we held a panel on this very program, a panel discussion, in which I think the temperament of those who were participating was that uh, the Russians had gotten a very substantial jump on us scientifically, one which they appeared able to maintain for a good long while. Uh, your statement, to which I referred earlier from the satellite and rocket uh, panel, uh, implied that we could uh, restore our scientific position if indeed it had been lost. What is your evaluation of our relative positions now, scientifically, and taking into consideration the extraordinary weight of Sputnik 3, for example? Well, I think uh, Lee DuBridge put this very well in a lecture recently that if one compares the uh, scientific advancements in Russia with those in America, he should be thinking of uh, not the race between two speedboats, and then one could always tell, say, which one of the two is ahead, but he should be thinking of a race between two flotillas of speedboats in which, we say, ours are all blue and theirs are all red, and and there's some red boats are ahead of some blue boats, and on the whole, it's a little difficult to tell which uh, flotilla is leading. And I think that puts the matter very well in science, that it's a very diverse uh, field in some branches of chemistry. It's quite evident that America, we're ahead here in America and other branches of, of chemistry that they are ahead. And uh, uh, say oceanography, it's quite likely they are ahead of us. And, in nuclear physics, we are perhaps ahead of them, although it's sort of neck and neck in that case. And so it's a very uh, a matter of very great uh, difficulty to make any simple statement. In fact, any simple statement is almost certainly uh, wrong if and unless it is suitably qualified in this sense. Uh -huh. Now, there's no doubt that they are a great deal ahead of us in putting large objects in orbit around the Earth. There's no doubt about that. And it will take us, I think, at the minimum of four or five years to have any reasonable prospect of overtaking them. Now, by the end of this year, we'll likely be able to put up uh, payloads of uh, two or three hundred pounds in orbit. And that's about our immediate, uh, that's, uh, that's our fairly immediate prospect by the end of this calendar year. Now, this is still a great deal short of their one and a half ton payload in Sputnik 3. Now, <coughs> Of course, in mo as in most things, one can go very rapidly at first, and then when begin to approach the limits of knowledge, then, then it's not so easy to maintain a, a striking leadership. So I, I believe that in the course of several years, if we keep at it in a quite uh, determined way, we can overtake them, at least uh, pull even with them in this field, too. Now you speak of uh, our next development. Um, possibly a 200 or 300 pound uh, satellite package. What about your goals as listed uh, last December? Uh, some of them seem to me amazingly ambitious, such as a manned permanent satellite by 1965. That's point eight. Uh, um, closer to the early part of the list, uh, impact on the moon with non-survival of apparatus by 1959. That's only a year away. Uh, do we stand a chance of maintaining this, this timetable as laid out by your panel? Yes, we do. I, I would say we're pretty well on to it uh, hmm. as it stands now. In fact, we may have impact on the moon with non-survival before the end of 1958. Well, that is an amazing revela revelation in itself. I said we may have. It. I said <laughs> we, the, the well, will uh, be uh, one of our what we call earnest tries well before then, and it might succeed. One of the questions constantly asked, uh, uh, I ask it of myself frequently, is why do we want to put something on the moon? Why do we want uh, apparatus on the moon, for example? Yeah, well, that's a good question, of course. I, uh, in, in our work here, we've developed the... Uh, 
a much stronger interest in what lies between the Earth and the Moon than the Moon itself. That's our own uh, greater interest here. And in so-called interplanetary space, now as you recall in Explorers 1 and 3, we found some very exciting new results on the intensity of radiation, uh, which exists above about five or six hundred miles in the vicinity of the Earth. Mm -hmm. Now we'd like very much to uh, continue these observations and to see whether this high intensity of radiation is, exists all the way to the sun, becoming more intense as we approach the sun, or whether it is a relatively local phenomenon in the vicinity of the Earth alone. <coughs> now a flight of a simple apparatus from the Earth to the moon, in which the moon has nothing to do with the case, except that it is about 60 Earth radii away, such a flight would be of very great interest in understanding how the aurora is formed and in filling out the picture of the radiation environment of the Earth. Now this is a, it's a pure scientific investigation. We don't know what to make of this, even if we knew it as far as practical, immediate practical benefits are concerned, but uh, this would be a very beautiful uh, scientific experiment. Now, there, of course, one can say the geology of the Earth has occupied the study uh, by men for many, many years. It is a very good prospect that the geology of the moon is just as interesting and maybe more interesting than the geology of the Earth. So as a, as a one interested in pure science, I think one could say the moon is a vastly interesting object for human study. Well now, as one final question, uh, you have mentioned this band of radiation or this area of radiation which was unexpectedly discovered, I take it by uh, uh, Explorer 3 uh, principally, or was it uh, discovered by both? So it was discovered by Explorer 1 observations mm -hmm. and then very strongly confirmed by 3. Yes. Uh, what will be the next development in that precise area, do you expect? Well, uh, we're very busily preparing apparatus now for uh, another Explorer flight later on this year. Uh, Carl McElwain and George Ludwig are making some very much more uh, discriminating type of radiation detectors to, con uh, to attempt to confirm and to greatly extend knowledge of what we have already discovered in earlier this year. Is there a, a, a date that you can reveal as to when this may be expected to take place? Uh, no, I can't, uh, I can't mention the date as, uh, tonight, but the, uh, as you can see from the way the lights are burning in the physics building mm -hmm. late into the night and early into the morning these days, it's uh, not likely to be uh, so terribly far mm -hmm. away. Well, Dr. Van Allen, we're indebted to you once again for another appearance on our program, the IGY program. And I want to thank you not only for contributing to uh, my knowledge and the knowledge of our audience, but for setting to rest some of the fears which were raised by Mr. Finney's article. Thank you again.